Hello and welcome to this 12 hour readathon where I read this many books over the course of two days. Let's take a look at what I've read. Okay, so I read some more of The Witch and the Tsar by Olesya Salnikova Gilmore. This was touted as a reclaiming and reinventing of Baba Yaga. How about you don't? How about you don't? Her version of Yaga is an immortal, so her mother was a goddess. She's centuries old, but you wouldn't think that. She acts like she's a teenager. I'm not even shitting you. She is so naive and weak and meek and mild and lost. And it's just, who is this? Baba Yaga is this badass, wicked witch who likes to eat children and live in her house on chicken legs. This Baba Yaga is pathetic in comparison. And basically she just relies upon her animal familiar, so her wolf and her owl, to do all the grunt work. <sighs> I could not accept her as a Baba Yaga reimagining. So I decided after I think about 80 or so pages, how many? 58, after 58 pages, to read some reviews. And a lot of Russian people were absolutely blasting this. And I'm like, okay, well, Russians are saying it's really not a great representation of Russian folklore. And they were also taking issue with, with a lot of the use of the Russian words and the incorrect uses of uh, shortening names. So I thought, you know what, forget about it. Life's too short to read a, a subpar retelling of Russian folklore. If you want to read a great book about, about Russian folklore, I highly recommend The Bear and the Nightingale. I thought that was fantastic and was far more enjoyable than this. Even the writing, even the writing wasn't great. It was really dull and stiff and soulless. I wasn't a fan of this at all, so I decided to DNF that. So today I have to clean up my house. It is an absolute pigsty. And besides that, I have to stay home because I'm getting deliveries today of meat and fruit and lots of things. So I thought, well, if I have to stay home, why not do a 12 hour readathon? I can do it today and may mayhaps tomorrow as well if I need extra time. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an audiobook. That way I can clean. I can get all my cleaning done. I'm one of those people who cannot relax if their house is messy, I, I can't. So there's things I have to do and I must get them done and then I may reap the rewards of my free time. <laughs> so I checked Libby to see which books were available as an audiobook and I wanted something short because I prefer to read rather than listen to audiobooks. I only really listen to audiobooks if I am going on a walk. So I thought I'd pick up Carmilla, which is meant to be a very gothic vampire tale and it's only three hours. And if I listen to that at one and a half times speed, I can just put that on while I'm doing all my cleaning and then be done and start reading. So start with that one. I've just finished reading Carmilla. I'm about two hours in. It is interesting to note that this was written before Dracula. I just find it fascinating that people can think of these same fantastical creatures as, as if they're in the human consciousness as a collective. It's, it's really interesting and fascinating. And this was also a sapphic novel, which I really don't think was very common at that time. So it is a vampiric sapphic novel. And you have Carmilla, 
who is the vampire and Laura, I think, who is the young lady that Carmilla sort of preys upon. The book itself had a quietness to it. It was mostly based on Camilla and Laura's relationship and their interactions. I'm not sure how willing a participant Laura was in their interactions. I do feel like Camilla was quite, felt like Camilla sort of pushed herself on Laura quite a bit. I don't know how I feel about this book, to be honest. The writing was fine. It was very easy to listen to. I appreciate that it gets into the story quite quickly. It is a short novel and I actually like short novels to be honest. There is obviously quite a bit left unexplained. So they discover that Carmilla is quite old. They discover pictures of her from the past, but they don't really, there's sort of a sort of explanation of how vampires are created, but not in depth. Like Camilla does supposedly have a mother and I would have liked to learn more about the mother. Yeah, and then, and then the story sort of just ends. I enjoyed it. I think I'm going to give it, I'm going to go with three. I'm going to go with three. It's not anything that's sort of impacted me in any way. There weren't any parts that I'm like, oh wow, that's amazing. That's really well written. Or I really love this character. So that didn't really happen. So I guess I'm going to give Carmilla a three, but it is a very easy read if you feel like having a bit of a sapphic vampire story in your life. But it is quite slow, as in nothing really happens. Even at the crescendo, it's quite mild and tame. So I guess it's easy on your nerves. The next book that I'm going to read is Pure Colour by Sheila Hetty. Uh, this is just a sort of a story in the life of a character. They say that Sheila Hetty is philosopher of modern experience. So I'm interested to see what this is like. And yeah, well, um, we'll get started. I just finished Pure Colour by Sheila Hetty. I have um, been reading for three hours and so I've got nine hours left. Boy, this is an odd little book, isn't it? It's about bears, birds and fish, lamps, meager little existences and the universe ejaculating your dead father's spirit into your body. <laughs> That's something that is uh, reiterated quite frequently. The writing is basically as if you're speaking to yourself and you're just having going off on it's basically just like a stream of consciousness of the main character just talking to herself having conversations with herself it is so bizarre it is very random she's living her life and then she's sort of there's i guess a magical realism in that in this book when her father passes away she her spirit enters a leaf with her father's spirit as well and she exists for quite a long time in this leaf with her dead father's spirit until her love interest brings her back out of her leaf. So I know it's supposed to be like metaphorical, but to her it's literal. When fashions herself a leaf costume and walks around in that. Um, the writing itself, I guess it's meant to have like a philosophical feel to it and is just Mira or Myra, the main characters, sort of thoughts and views and opinions of this existence. A lot of it is referring to God as the creator and that this cycle of humans are his first draft. And that the next cycle of humans won't even need to have children to feel love. They will just all love each other instantly. Um, there was a nice little, it was a funny little quote sort of about how people who are fatigued are made tired by the gods so that they don't try to change the world because the gods fear what they could do if they weren't tired. I thought that was funny. There are quite a lot of jarring sentences just thrown into this book. For instance, this widening was something Mira had never felt before or even known could be. It was like a vagina was stretching for a very large cock. But it was in her chest. I feel like a lot of these sentences, like for instance, the universe ejaculating her dead father's spirit into her body. Is there for shock value? That's the kind of, I found the energy with them. Just <laughs> let me be shocking with my crassness. The book overall, Pure Colour, 
The title was mentioned very briefly. So this is one of those weird books where you don't quite understand what is going on and sometimes it just feels like words are strung together. Um, but look, I, I actually somewhat enjoyed it. Um, it was fine. It was different. It was quite different to anything that I've read. Uh, the story itself includes a sapphic love interest and obviously Myra dealing with the death of her father. He much lived a very sheltered existence with. Just, and just the course of life, like the whole thing of being alive and then being dead. So yeah, I'm going to give it three stars. Um, would I read more from this author? Probably not. It's not the kind of writing that I really enjoy, but it was fine. The next book I'm going to read is The Seas, but I'm going to take a little break because reading that book made me so incredibly sleepy. I almost had a nana nap and I need to make, make myself some lunch, but I think I will read that next. I don't know how much reading I'm going to get done today, to be honest. After the audiobook and then that book, I'm not actually in the mood to read that much, surprisingly, but I know normally in the evening when the kids are watching their shows, I do tend to read a book on the couch, but the next book I will be picking up is The Seas, and supposedly it's about a woman who believes herself to be a mermaid, so it's supposed to be quite, well, I think may, maybe again with a magical realism, um, a bit delusional, but the writing is meant to be beautiful, so, and the cover is lovely. We shall see, we shall see. Okay, so I read 52 pages of The Seas, and I'm just starting to Dean effort. The writing is lovely. The book is, once again, has that really quiet energy to it, and you're in the main. The main protagonist is basically just sort of, it's a magical realism book. The main protagonist believes that she was a mermaid, and she has a fascination, obviously, with the ocean. She's obsessed with a war veteran who is 13 years her senior and who doesn't seem to reciprocate her intimate feelings towards him. Um, she's also dealing with the loss of her father, but it's just not riveting. There is nothing compelling in this book. There's nothing really interesting that's being said, and so therefore I'm DNFing it. I don't know what I'm going to read next. I'm going to take a break now, pick my kids up from school, but I'll let you know when I've chosen something. Okay, I have eight hours and 12 minutes left and the next book I'm reading is Written on the Body. This is a book about a person. We're not told what their gender is and the woman they love named Louise and she is a married woman. And it's just about their feelings towards Louise. It is quite long for just a book about one person's thoughts about another person. Um, I think that's why I gave it a lower rating. It just I just felt like it dragged on quite a bit. So it's very slow paced. It is sort of just about all of the nuances of being in love with someone and how you feel about them and how they're on your mind and how it affects you and your life. There was a scene though where there's obviously the conflict and I'm really not a fan of someone making a decision for someone else about their health. Um, it's like it's not your business <laughs> you need to allow them to make their own decisions so I really when that happened I wasn't really rooting for them anymore I'm like mm, yeah you made the wrong choice she's allowed to choose for herself what she wants to do with her body it's not your choice so I did sort of kind of lose interest in that later on there's another part of the book where it's about anatomy and they just talk about their lovers parts their eyes their sense of smell, the sight, the taste, so they go through the five senses. And there's this one um, part that people on the internet have talked about for ages, but no one actually read it out that I've seen. And it's in the, the taste part where they tell you what their partner's taste is like. So I'm going to read it out to you because people have mentioned the olive scene, the olive scene. This is the olive scene. Taste. There are four fundamental sensations of taste, sweet, sour, bitter, and salt. My lover is an olive tree whose roots grow by the sea, her fruit is pungent and green. It is my joy to get at the stone of her, the little stone of her hard by the tongue, her thick fleshed salt veined swaddled stone. Who eats an olive without first puncturing the swaddle, the weighted moment when the teeth shoot a strong burst of clear juice that has in it the weight of the land, the vicissitudes of the weather, even the first name of the olive keeper. The sun is in your mouth. The burst of an olive is breaking of a bright sky. The hot days when the rains come. Eat the day where the sand burned the soles of your feet before the thunderstorm brought up your skin in bubbles of rain. 
Our private grove is heavy with fruit. I shall worm me to the stone, the rough swaddle stone. So that is that scene. The kids are here, so I apologize for all the background noise. So yeah, I enjoyed it, but yeah, it's still not quite my thing, but um, that is a three star. I have six hours left to go um, for the 12 hour readathon. I'll probably finish that today, I think. The book that I'm going to read next is The Sea of Tranquility. Okay, so I have read about 50 pages of The Sea of Tranquility. It took me no time at all. The way the book is written and formatted makes it a very easy, quick read. The book is meant to be about time travel and art and love, but I just couldn't connect to it. It just felt very empty. To me, it just didn't have any depth or character or um, flavor. I just found it very bland. And I know some people absolutely love this, but it just wasn't doing anything for me. So I thought, let's not hurry on after 50 pages. I'm just going to DNF it. So the next book that I'm going to pick up is I Who Have Never Known Men. So I don't have long though before I have to go to my children's school. So I'll read what I can. And then most likely I will update you tomorrow on everything that I've read this evening, because once the kids are home, <laughs> there is no peace and quiet and I cannot really film Besides I Who Have Never Known Men, I'm also thinking of picking up The House in the Cerulean Sea as an audiobook so that I can put it on while I cook and do things like that. So let's chat about the last two books that I read as part of my 12 hour reading challenge. The next book that I decided to peruse was an audiobook version of The House in the Cerulean Sea. I got almost halfway through and the reason I pushed halfway was because obviously it was an audiobook and I had it on while I was doing things, but also because so many people love this, but this just was not doing it for me at all. It's about a 40 year old gay man who works in deciding whether or not magical children that are held by the government in government orphanages are dangerous to society and others or not. And then he's sent to this one particular orphanage with these particularly troublesome children and what is that is run by a, another gay man. And so it, taught, it sort of delves into their relationship together and about the kids um, and this guy's life. So I just didn't like the dude. I didn't like the writing, um, I didn't really care even about the children. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's a bit worrisome if you don't even care about the kids. Uh, and it just, yeah, it wasn't doing it for me. I then decided to go and read some reviews to see should I like persevere, but a lot of people were on quite furious that the author actually based this on um, these government schools for indigenous children that they had stolen from their parents. And then they sort of re-educate them and move them into other families. And so they were quite uh, angry about them, the author using that as a basis for this, you know, work. And I was like, all right, yeah, this is kind of getting messy and I'm out. I didn't love it to begin with. I didn't like the writing, the characters, just anything. Nothing grabbed, nothing stood out. It was background noise pretty much. I was like, this is really dull and I'm not getting more invested at all. So listened to that and then thank the book gods because I was getting really worried that this was just going to be such an uneventful, 12 hour readathon and then I picked up I who have never known men and my lord I oh I can't even I was left just mouth agape staring into the distance for hours after reading this book it haunts me even now this book begins with I think the uh quote my memory begins with anger which is quite powerful and it's about a nameless girl who grows up um as you read the story who finds herself in this prison with 39 other women of varying ages. The women were from Earth and they remember their lives, but they don't remember how they got there. And none of them know why they are there. They are guarded by these men who do not interact with them unless to whip them for breaking the rules. There are many rules, one of being that they, they cannot touch each other. So this child was put in this place, has no recollection of her life before, and had to grow up without even the comfort of another human being's touch. It is so profound and gripping and bone chilling. I can't say much about what happens next because giving away the plot sort of gives away the story because this is a book that is both bleak and beautiful. 
It's a book where not a lot happens and yet everything happens. It's agonizingly heartbreaking and yet a start felt. It's just this dichotomy. And I kept hoping against everything. Like all of the characters in the book, I was just hoping and and I can't give away what happens in the end, but it was just it was just stunning. It was stunning. Um if you are after happy endings, I wouldn't read this book per se. If you are someone who needs answers, and normally I am, you've probably heard many times I've gone and said in books that I haven't liked, so many things are left unanswered. There are so many things that are not explained and that infuriated me with those books. But yet in this book, in which you are left without explanation and answers and reasons and whys, it's okay. It's okay because it works with this book and this story. It is just, ah, oh, it is so frustrating and yet so impactful, I guess. Um, basically, this is a speculative fiction that really centers around life and death, as well as loneliness and longing and what it means to be a human displaced. I thought it was just wonderful. It was all kinds of wonderful. It was, like I said, harrowing and you felt yourself being angry along with the protagonist um, at their plight, at their circumstance and not knowing why this was being done to them if they were, they were ever going to be free, if they could ever find their way back home. It was just, ah, oh, so much, so much. And yeah, obviously very, very women-centered because the 39, the 40 women are the main characters. Oh, just amazing. And this is a translated piece. And before I've had a lot of issues with translated works in that they just felt cold. They just felt very lifeless. Um, it just didn't work. And I just thought it's got to be the lost in translation thing because these really aren't the translator isn't the one that created this world, created these words. They're just translating someone else's um, ideas and creativity. But this was fine. I didn't even realize it was translated until after I read it. The writing is very simple. That to be said, it is quite just to the point, but it is still loaded with emotion um, and depth. So this book, oh, hallelujah for this book. I just, I loved it. Um, what am I going to give it? Look, I can't give it five stars because it is just so um, devastating and I can't give books that devastate me five stars. I can only give books that just give me that giddiness and happiness and joy five stars. So it's four and a half and it's almost there. If, Like I said, it's just because the tone of the book and the type of the story that it's just not a five star book for me, but it is four and a half stars. And like I said, I will round it up on Goodreads. It's just phenomenal. Um, I highly recommend. It's just a great, and it's a short book too, so it doesn't take forever to read, and it just gets straight into it, and just wow, 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 wow. So those were all the books that I read in this 12-hour readathon. Obviously, the standout is I Who Have Never Known Men. My God. There were a few DNFs. That's Sylvie climbing the curtain. Uh, she doesn't run outside anymore, which is great. So Blue has worn her out in that respect. She has no desire to go out but she still climbs those curtains to run across all the palmets, which is basically another version of her vertical runs. She's just like, why have just one when I can have one in every room? Yes, her and Blue are playing together wonderfully. They even slept side by side last night, so not curled into each other, but touching. And I just, uh, it melts my heart. Willow still is chasing and growling, but I'm sure with time she'll come round. But yeah, those were all the books for this week. I hope that wherever you are, you are having an amazing morning, afternoon or evening. And as always, stay wild, star child.